Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this webinar, Tracking the Effective Coverage of Large-Scale Food Fortification, Introduction to the Fortimans Methodology. So my name is Saskia Ozendarp, and I'm the Executive Director of the Micronutrients Forum, and we are delighted to welcome you to the conversation today, which is organized by the European Union Food Fortification Advisory Service, TUFAS, which is an advisory service that is funded by the EU and implemented through a partnership between Lando Mills and the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition or Gain, in partnership with the Iodine Global Network, IGN, and the Micronutrient Forum. So this webinar is being live streamed on the GAIN YouTube channel and a link to that channel will be put in the chat now. In today's program, we will introduce you to the Fortimas methodology, uh, which can be used to track effective coverage of fortified foods. And we will take stock of some recent experiences in countries where the Fortimas methodology was used and implemented and where progress was made in adapting the methodology to various food vehicles. We have a um, panel of esteemed panelists that will present this methodology to you and present why it was developed. It will share the basic concepts and premises of the Fortimas methodology, and it will illustrate the necessity of ongoing public-private uh, sector engagement towards documented sustained coverage of large-scale food fortification uh, programs. We will, we will also summarize findings that are based on the adaptation of the Fortimas methodology in two countries to date. And we will learn from the Iodine Global Network on why and how they tried and in, um, the Fortimas methodology and how they intend to implement this methodology for assessment and tracking of salt iodization programs. As part of today's webinar, we will have four speakers and we will have two Q&A sessions to cover the content and to begin to address your questions to, uh, on this methodology. So throughout the webinar, we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A box that you can find on the bottom of your Zoom screen instead of in the general chat. And those questions that are put in the Q&A box will be shared with the panel during the Q&A sessions of the webinar, or if time does not permit to address all the questions, we will aim to answer them in the Q&A chat. So with this brief introduction, I would now like to ask two individuals to formally introduce this webinar to you. The first is Fadoy Shaouki, who is a policy officer at uh, nutrition at the European Commission. And the second is Christophe Guillondet, who is team leader of TUFAS. So over to you, Fadoy. Thank you, Saskia. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming for this webinar. So my name is uh, Fada Shaoki. I'm a nutrition policy officer at the European Commission for International Partnerships, so INTPA. And um, the European Commission is engaged in the fight uh, against all forms of malnutrition, including uh, micronutrient, micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, we believe that um, food fortification is an efficient tool to, to fight against this kind of malnutrition. We actually fund several programs of food fortification um, through uh, our different uh, partner countries. And uh, for us, it is important to, um, to check and uh, be able to, um, yeah, to, to follow up, to mon monitor the impact of, of uh, those programs and the impact in general of food fortification. That's why it is good to have such a tool as uh, Fortimas. So thank you for coming. And uh, I will let uh, hand over to my uh, partner, Christophe. Thank you. Partner in work. <laughs> uh, yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Fadwa, and again, uh, very welcome to everyone, and thank you for taking the time to, to join us and take part of this webinar. Um, we hope it will be informative for you all. Um, my name is Christophe Guillaudet, I'm the, I'm the Too Fast team leader. Um, Too Fast, for those who don't know, has been set up um, as a partnership of GAIN and landowners, like Saskia mentioned, uh, back in December 2015, so we have just over six years of uh, operation. 
our mandate is essentially to, to backstop um, the food fortification projects uh, funded by the EU. Uh, we have three main priorities. One is to increase the um, action and political commitment to food fortification at the global and national level. And um, recently, the European Union uh, has made a significant commitment to, to nutrition, uh, which we, um, we believe uh, you know, we, we contributed to um, through, through um, our work over the past six years. Um, our second priority is to support um, countries and delegations in implementing their food fortification project through technical assistance. We have um, a, a roster of uh, consultants that work with TFAS um, and have been dedicated to uh, help countries in, in the implementation of uh, a number of fortification projects. And third, um, uh, we aim to share uh, knowledge, lessons learned, um, and best practices around food fortification. And it is really in the framework of this last point that we have decided to host this webinar today um, to present to our delegations, but more widely to the fortification um, um, community, if I may say, um, a methodology, the FortiMAS methodology, that we believe is not only just cost effective, um, but it's also logistically uh, easy and, and practical to implement uh, in order to monitor food fortification programs. And the timing of this webinar is particularly relevant for us at TUFAS and the EU, because six years ago, the EU funded um, 10 projects, uh, 10 fortification projects in eight countries um, across Africa, in Chad, in DRC, Ethiopia, the Gambia, um, Kenya, Madagascar, Niger, and Sudan. And these projects, they're all coming to an end at the end of this year. And so they're reaching this critical stage in the lifetime, in the lifetime uh, of any uh, given um, fortification project where donor funding will be ending, but we'll still obviously need to continue to mobilize interest, to mobilize commitment and resources uh, for, the, for, for fortification to, to continue and to sustain the actions that were implemented in the past six years. So one of the ways I believe to continue to mobilize interest and resources is to show impact. It's just as simple as that, to show that there is improvement in micronutrient status, that um, quality fortified foods are on the market and that there is effective coverage um, of this population. And as Fadwa mentioned, this is uh, what this workshop will be about. Uh, let's present to you this methodology, um, how, what it is, how it's been implemented in various countries and how it's been adapted to uh, various food labels. So uh, with that, I'm just going to end now and thank you again for joining us and I hope that you'll be able to learn uh, about the methodology today. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Christophe, and thank you, Fadori, for this introduction. Uh, we will now move to the, the webinar, which has been um, divided in two sections. In the first one, we will give you an introduction to the FortiMAS methodology. This will be given by Quinton Johnson and Ibrahim Profanta, whom I will introduce. Uh, and that will be followed by a brief Q&A section. And then we will move to the second section of the webinar, uh, in which, um, as has been indicated, two um, people from IGN will present country experiences in using this methodology uh, in a country setting. So uh, I would like to introduce now uh, Quinton Johnson to you. Uh, he is a fortification consultant at Quinken Inc. And he's a professional with over 32 years of experience in new product development, in quality assurance and in regulatory affairs in the food and medical device industries in North America and the United Kingdom. But his main interest is in the milling and baking sectors of the food industry. He also provides consulting services to the United Nations, to national donor aid agencies and international NGOs on staple food fortification. And he will share with us why Smarter Futures supported the development of this 40 mass methodology. Over to you, Quinton. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening in some parts of the world. Um, thank you for your kind introduction. I would just like to add that um, Fortimas uh, came about as a result of uh, a number of discussions with the late Anna Verster. And um, Anna was uh, a senior nutritionist within WHO. Uh, she retired and uh, joined um, Smarter Futures. And in fact, she was 
the main driving force to get the funding for Smarter Futures, which is uh, fortification programs in, in Africa. Uh, Anna was getting frustrated by the fact that we had no idea as to how well the fortification program is being carried out. And uh, Abe worked on a methodology and um, it has been used in a number of countries already. And from my perspective, uh, it it was a it was a break it was a it was a deal breaker. And um, I would like to then move on to my next slide, please. Um, so the Fortimas stands for uh, fortification monitoring and surveillance, and um, it's an acronym developed by Smarter Futures and helps answer the question, is micronutrient status of people who regularly consume sufficient quality fortified flour improving? And the sufficient has an asterisk, asterisk with it, which is based on an estimate of per capita flour consumption. It can also be easily adapted to uh, track other food fortification programs. And uh, so I can then move on to the next slide, please. The reason that it was developed was when fortification food, uh, staple food fortification started to be adopted at the global level, the nutrition community wanted to see nutrition impact as soon as possible. And sadly, little attention was paid to the status of a fortification program at the industry or at the supplier level. Uh, there was lack of information on availability and distribution of fortified foods. And uh, in order to make sure that we, uh, that people had uh, an, some indication of an impact, a tool using national nutrition surveys was were carried out at great expense um, which was designed to show impact at the population level, but didn't uh, take into account and doesn't take into account the lack of knowledge on the lack of distribution of fortified foods in the country. And so Fortifamass was developed to assess and track micronutrient status at the population level in combination with uh, the status of fortification in fortified food sectors. Can I have the next slide, please? What can it do? It can give a snapshot on the status of the supply and distribution of quality fortified foods in the country. A uh, definition of qualified foods that it, it's a, it meets the standard of a fortified uh, food by a that developed by a country or even at the regional level. Uh, and one of the key aspects of it is that uh, the use of sentinel sites, and I will leave uh, uh, A. Pavanta to talk a little bit more about that. Um, the, in the, on the supply side, the food industry, particularly in the registered food industry business, acts as the sentinel sites on the supply of fortified foods and following uh, good uh, food control and food practices uh, by the Food and Drug Administrations and the government, they can have a good, a good idea as to whether the food industry is actually following the standards and providing the food as specified in the regulations of a, of a country. It can be applied to assessing effective coverage of any nationally produced and imported food. And using the data of the quantity and quality of fortified foods, countries can determine coverage of the foods to see if the food is sufficient to improve the micronutrient status of the population. Countries can determine at relatively modest cost the status of a fortification program without always resorting to expensive national nutrition surveys. And that was basically uh, the work that uh, Abe has put together. And at this point, um, that's the end of my uh, opening remarks. And I would just like to add that it was 
a, a certainly far-sighted of the late Dr. Anna Versta in helping us to fund and develop this program. So in memory of her, I'll pass this over to A. Pavanta. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Quentin, and uh, very much uh, appreciate your uh, memorial for the late Anna Verster, whom we all hold dear, close to our hearts. Um, I would like now to um, introduce Dr. Ibrahim Pravanta, or A, as he is also being called, in case you were wondering whether this is the same person. Yes, it is. Um, so he's a public health nutrition professional with over 30 years of technical and leadership management experience at, in the United States as well as holding advisory and consulting roles in more than 30 countries. So he is ex experienced in the development of policies and strategies related to the prevention and control of micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, strengthening maternal and, nutrition and child's nutrition programs through evidence-based interventions and technical and program capacity development, and designing and implementation of feasible and ongoing data systems for monitoring and surveillance of the quality coverage and the impact of public health nutrition interventions. And as such, he's very qualified to present to us um, the Fortimus methodology and uh, to give some, um, some of the basic, share some of the basic principles uh, of this methodology. Over to you, Ibrahim. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Saskia, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you to Quentin for mentioning and uh, our dear, uh, colleagues, former colleague uh, Anna Verster, the late, late Anna Verster, who really was, uh, as Quinton said, the force behind uh, our effort to develop this methodology. So uh, just hello and greetings to everyone. Uh, and today I want to give you a brief overview of the 40 months methodology at kind of at a very, you know, global level at a very high level, not into the very, a lot of the details, with, um, but hopefully during the uh, Q&A sessions, we can have some further discussion on that. So my plan is to present to you the broad premises of the Forty Mass methodology to explain a little bit more about what Sentinel data collection is based on in, in the methodology that we have developed. And then to summarize some of the benefits of the Forty Mass methodology. Next slide, please. So this diagram uh, referred to as the 40 mass formula uh, summarizes the first and overarching premise of the 40 mass methodology and illustrates a, system, a systematic approach to monitoring and surveillance of a food fortification program. As you note in boxes A and B, it requires public private sector collaboration to first confirm the consistency of quality and sustained high coverage of a target fortified food over an appropriate length of time, as shown in box C, before looking for the nutritional impact of the intervention shown in box D. And in principle, this methodology, this approach would be then continued over time. And as Quinton mentioned, the aim of this was to try to help countries avoid expanding resources on doing large surveys or evaluation survey at a time or a place where such impact might not be evident. Next slide, please. The second premise is that with sustained high population coverage of a fortified food, findings on the micronutrient status using a non-representative population data would be reflective of the situation in the broader population. As illustrated by this example from Oman, since the start of that country's mandatory flower fortification program in 1996, the declining trend in anemia prevalence among a non-representative first trimester pregnant women who sought antenatal care services is reflective of the trend in anemia prevalence based on three representative surveys of non-pregnant women of childbearing age that were conducted in the country in 2000, 2000 2004, and 2008. Uh, next, uh, thank you. So the third premise that we have to keep in mind is that the aim of the 40 mass methodology 
is to assess and track effective coverage of a food fortification program as a public health intervention. It is not to carry out a cause effect research study. Next slide, please. The fourth and kind of final broad premise of the methodology is that the triangulation of information using reliable complementary data through different sources enables better assessment of the fortification program as a whole. This diagram is to illustrate an example of triangulation of information related to a hypothetical fortified flower program. Essentially, this part of the diagram shows that relevant information from flower producers, importers, and or wholesalers, as well as relevant government authorities, such as the Ministry of Industry, Ministry of Commerce, or Food Control Agency, could be used to estimate the amount of fortified flour available in the country. And based on that, calculate the overall, what referred to as expected population coverage of the product. Then with the collaboration of the private sector, the market distribution of the fortified flour would be mapped to identify sub-regions of the country likely to have you know, close to 80% or higher coverage, uh, population coverage of the product. Uh, next, please. So, and then among the subregions where the annual population coverage is expected to be high, population level data could be collected to confirm the high coverage if needed. And you've noticed that I've said if needed, because if we, if the collaboration with the industry is good and the, in the data, the available data from those, those sectors are reliable, then uh, it may not be necessary to confirm it. But if need be, that uh, the 40 months methodology allows a rapid way to assess, to, or to confirm the high coverage before moving on. So uh, next, please. Now, after the high fort fortified flower coverage is sustained for at least a one year period, and that's the key other part. If you think about a bit of time of the intervention, then a, a round of surveillance data on feasible impact indicators would be collected. And without going into too much detail at this point on it, I just want to let you know bring to your attention that in many low and middle income countries, data on hemoglobin test results on first trimester pregnant women and neural tube defects affected pregnancies are already available in relevant health facilities and could be systematically analyzed and reported over time as impact indicators of that flower fortification program. Of course, we have to keep in mind that for subregions where low coverage of fortified flower is expected, you see, we don't forget about them. We have to develop appropriate strategies to see how to increase that coverage before looking for impact in those areas. Next slide, please. Now, we've talked about Sentinel data or Sentinel sites. And so I just wanna give you a little over, brief overview of this. The term Sentinel comes from the French word Sentinelle, and I hope I pr pronounced that correctly in French, which means a sentry or a watchman. And as you would imagine, the location where a sentry, a guard, if you will, is posted to watch for a potential danger is not randomly selected. Instead, the location of the post of that guard is purposefully chosen to enable the sentry to most easily identify a potential threat and sound the alarm. Now in public health, sentinel population refers to an at-risk or susceptible population that is watched, monitored or watched over for the appearance or recurrence of an expected outcome. And this methodology really kind of developed uh, through, uh, you know, the uh, infectious disease programs, but it can be obviously used in, it has been adapted to uh, other public health interventions. And the 40 mass methodology, the, the, plan, the basic premise is to first, we need to identify sub, sub geographic areas of a country with high population coverage of the target food. And then, per, and then so that we can purposefully you know, with the help of the food food sector, uh, the fortified food sector, we would purposefully select um, those sentinel those particular subregions, 
uh, for population level data collection, because that is where the impact is likely to be detected. A sentinel site on the other hand re refers to a community within that large subject subgeographic area where the population data would be collected. And then we came up with the term data collection point, which refers to a sentinel, a, a setting or a facility, for example, a health center, a hospital, a school, um, uh, sorry, uh, in a house, uh, houses of worship, where uh, within, the, within those sentinel sites, where target subjects could be efficiently recruited for data collection using convenient sampling methods. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, oh, sorry, go, uh, go back when I, I missed it, sorry. And then finally, I just to give you some uh, ideas about some of the benefits of the 40 mass methodology based on the experiences to date. First of all, you know, countries could implement it uh, on their own without too much external technical support. Furthermore, it allows for fortified food producers and importers, as well as the relevant government agencies, aside from the Ministry of Health, to understand how their data is important in tracking the population and the population's nutritional status. And I want to emphasize this uh, a little bit more because in many countries that I've been working in, and I think uh, my friend uh, Quinton would um, attest to this, uh, the fortified food producers often kind of complain that their efforts are not uh, adequately uh, acknowledged by the public health sector. So we have to be a cognizant of that and really try to recognize them when they, when they, do, the, when they do the job. So the other point is that it's with these limitations considered, each round of 40 mass data collection based on our experience so far, costs substantially less than a typical micro, uh, representative micronutrient survey. And then the other point is that it, you know, it could alert the fortification program stakeholders of changes in the market distribution of fortified food that might impact the population's micronutrient status. So for example, in South Africa, as I recall, when they started the program and back in two th early 2000s, they, the law went to in fact to fortify bread flour, but over the number of years afterwards, the proportion market share of cake flour which was not required to be fortified, increased substantially. And that kind of affected the market contribution, if you will, of the bread flour. And that was not, it would have been easily detected through the 40 months methodology if they had it, we had it at that time. Can you please wrap up? Uh, even? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm almost, yeah, just about finished. And, and finally, we could help, uh, imp you know, help also Use, because we use data from the uh, public sec health sector, it could help improve the utility and quality of the health statistics data. So uh, with that, I uh, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very uh, interesting and very clear introduction to the methodology. And we are now have a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, so we, you haven't submitted any questions yet in the Q&A chat, so please, uh, feel free to do so. The chat can be found in the bottom of your Zoom uh, screen. Uh, but in the meantime, I would have a few questions for um, for uh, both speakers, actually, for Ibrahim and, um, um, and for Quinton. Um, and the first is about this Sentinel uh, methodology. Uh, and I think that's a question for you, uh, Abe. How, how can we interpret this population level data, especially since you already indicated that these are to be selected based on uh, high coverage of uh, fortified foods, which makes sense if you want to know something about the impact of the program. But from a needs perspective, they, they may not necessarily overlap, correct? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I think there are two aspects. So first of all, I mean, you know, the key is to look for where there is impact. I mean, we're if it's be, even if we did a random representative survey, depending on how that survey is designed, it may or may not pick up uh, the level of uh, the level of impact. So the first thing is to you know look for where we think there is impact, because the aim is to to start showing you know some improvement. And theoretically, you know, even without looking for biochemical measures or you know laboratory measures of impact, in principle, if we have 
adequate qualities of the, in quantities of the quality of the adequately fortified flour enough for people to eat on, on that level that as Quentin mentioned, if they're eating it at, you know, it's accessible to them at the sufficient levels, in principle, their, improve, their status should be improving. But here's the other part that with Sentinel data, because it's, it is not representative, it's, it's, it's a reflective data. So what we, the interpretation we have is that it helps answer the question, is the situation improving among those pop, that population? It, it doesn't tell, it's not designed to say, this is the level of micronutrient deficiency. So we don't say this is X percent is prevalent, you know, deficient. We say, this is, a, you know, here's a pattern of what is happening. And I think that's the, the limitations, if you will. But as I sh finally, I guess I would say that would be like, as I showed you the example from Oman, those patterns were very, very similar. Now, you know, the pattern was the same. Now, the, the levels of anemia, for example, that was reported from the survey versus the, their surveillance system were slightly different, but they were not so different that you would make any different policy decisions. Right, thanks. And we, I'm sure this will, this will uh, come back later on in the discussion as well. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A chat and I'm reading them out uh, to you. The first one is from Louise Aboyomi. Thank you very much, Louise, for your question. And it is about, you know, uh, this methodology really requires in addition to strengthen national uh, capacities in general in food fortification, but particularly also in product testing, um, in um, uh, fortification process validation. And I think uh, some of the data that you used also require strengthening national uh, capacities, for instance, in labs. Um, so these are not always synergistically being addressed in, uh, in, uh, across countries. So um, what, what solution would you propose? And maybe that's a question to Quinton as well. And I also realize that we may partly address this question later on as well when we have the opportunity to listen to two countries with, uh, you know, based on their experiences. Quinton, why don't you go first? Okay. Um, <clears throat> the issue around labs is an important one. Um, and uh, the uh, capacity to, to measure, uh, particularly iron, is relatively strong um, because it's, uh, the, the methodology is, is uh, atomic absorption or, um, and uh, methodologies. Uh, when it comes to measuring folic acid, that's a bit of a, bit of a challenge and it requires uh, uh, HPLC uh, technology. So given a choice for national labs to be able to measure the quality of fortified flour um, and knowing that the premix contains more than one micronutrient, it would include ions or sometimes zinc, but it also includes uh, uh, B1, B2, B3 maybe and, and folic acid. So in a way what you can do is if there's strong capacity for measuring um, the metals in foods, you can use that technology to determine as to whether the flour is adequately fortified uh, quantitatively and at a relatively uh, reasonable cost. Um, and one of the other points that I would also add is that uh, if, the, if uh, governments want to measure all of those micronutrients, that's a big expense to be able to do that. Um, and it's much better to, in, in effect, use iron and or zinc as the marker um, to determine that the uh, addition rates have been uh, followed by the flour mills. So. Yeah. Thanks, Quentin. That, that also addresses in part, at least, a question that was also raised in the Q&A chat by Robert Asidu, who was asking about the costs, and um, he, he was suggesting that this is mostly expensive, so the poor cannot afford. I think based on this question, he was maybe referring to fortified foods and not so much to this methodology, but as you said already, this methodology comes, of course, at some cost, but it's always less expensive than, um, than, uh, than the alternatives of doing a full mm -hmm. survey. Um, I, would, I would just like to add that there's an important quality control tool that millers use uh, when it comes to assessing the uh, addition rate of the, of, of the premix in, in the flour as it is being milled. And that's a check weighing step because the mills, the millers always know exactly how much flour per, ton, uh, per hour, how many tons per hour are being produced. 
And from that, they can determine how many grams of premix need to be uh, added. And that's, uh, there's two methods that they use, one in combination, and one is to uh, check weigh the feeders to determine that so many grams per minute is being added to meet the standard. And secondly, there's a very uh, rapid spot test that the millers can use to determine that it's actually there as well. And they yeah. can compare the spot test to a standard sample and they can yeah. say, yes, okay, we're following it correctly. Yeah. If I, if Sasuke, if I may make another comment and just in here, this is what I've learned from Quinton. People, you know, I'm a nutrition person, not an industry person. And I, one of the things I've learned over the years is that you see that one of the key things that we have to think about, even with testing of products, is that we're looking, you know, as I mentioned, the aim is to see what is the consistency of the quality, not that quality at that one point that the product is tested, but the batches, large batches or over time, it has to be consistent. And so one of, you know, as Quentin said, one of the tech tools that um, are methods that is used, at least as I understand in the United States or Canada, for example, even by the mill by the food producer, not just millers, food, you know, fortified food producers, but also for the regulatory agencies is what they call a premix reconciliation uh, tool and where, where they look at the use of pre how much, you know, they look at how much premix was used, how much flour was produced, they look at the records. And based on that, they can make a good estimation of whether the, the product would have been adequately fortified. And then the testing is just to verify that the process is good. It's not, it's not the actual test of the product. The, the test is based on this consist of on records that records 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 yeah thanks uh, there are a number of questions in the chat that actually all relates to uh countries that are interested in applying this methodology uh, in their country and they would like to know where they can obtain more information and there's a general question uh by dora panagidas in how many countries have already used uh, this methodology um so would you have an uh, a quick and answer to that question and then also maybe a quick answer on where countries that are interested in this methodology can find more information and we can um, we will have a second q a session at the end of the second section of this webinar just want to remind everyone that we will try to address as many of the questions in the q a chat that have not been addressed in this session so please hold your breath because uh, your questions will hopefully uh, be addressed all in this uh, in this session but maybe first uh, over to you, uh, Ibrahim, to give a brief overview of the number of countries that have already uh, used this methodology and maybe also where interested country representatives can find more information on this methodology. Okay, um, so far the number of countries are not that many, but we have uh, the methodology has been implemented uh, in, in, Georgia, in the Republic of Georgia and Republic of Turkmenistan and uh, at least in the first rounds, you know, it's just because, uh, you know, the, the, the methodology is not all that old, you know, it's relatively new. So, um, and it worked very well, at least based on experiences And my colleague Gregory will be speaking about these experiences a little bit. Uh, it is currently kind of, we're working to implement it in the Gambia, it's called the Gambia, they refer to it as the Gambia 40 mass system. So that's where we're working. And there's some pilot round of data collection that shows relative you know, good ability to do it. Uh, and so those are the three countries where they, there's some work has been done. Um, as far as getting information about the methodology, obviously people are happy to, uh, I'm happy to answer people's questions, but uh, the Smarter Futures is where was the group that, uh, you know, developed, you know, funded the development of the, 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 the methodology and the, the document on the flower fortification component yeah, is available on that uh, on their website, and we are now working as uh, Arnold will be speaking to adapt that to uh, USI or saltization. Yeah. Thank you very much. And for now, we will close this part of the Q and A uh, se uh, session, and also close this first part of this webinar. And we will move on to uh, where we will hear more and learn more from country experiences, as already uh, Ibrahim already introduced uh, to us where we will hear from uh, two speakers uh, that will um, uh, present to us taking stocks of lessons learned and also some challenges and areas for future development. Um, and we will first hear from Gregory Gerasimov, who is the Regional Advisor for Eastern Europe and Central Asia of Iodine Global Network, and then uh, Dr. Arnold Timmer, who is a Senior Advisor from IGN. 
So uh, Gregory joined IGN as regional coordinator in 1992, working through a network of national representatives uh, in countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And he's supporting the monitoring of iodine salt coverage, uh, population iodine status, and the sustainable elimination of iodine deficiency. Um, and Gregory will, uh, in, will discuss with us the experiences of uh, using the Fortimas methodology in, uh, um, in, in two countries uh, of IGN. Over to you, Gregory. Uh, thank you, Saskia. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, and we were talking about the experience which we made from the Republic of Georgia and from Turkmenistan. Next slide, please. So, um, next one. Yeah, so first of all, um, you know, the Republic of Georgia, just a little bit overview, is a country in the South Caucasus with a population of 3.7 million. And it's uh, a mountain country with about 80% population of country covered by hills and and mountains, and uh, it was historically quite iodine deficient with some cases of endemic goiter and endemic creatinism in not that uh, in, in, in the past. So um, they have a, the country has a national legislation which uh, prohibits production, importation, and trade of non-iodine salt, which is strictly enforced. So it's a country which is importing only iodine salt, and uh, it has no local production. So the salt was coming from several countries. And um, uh, <clears throat> in 1916, the Ministry of Health decided to implement uh, the system, which they call Georgian Nutrition Monitoring Surveillance System, based on Fortimas model, tracking iodine status, anemia, and uh, neural tube, tube disease with support of US CDC. I must say that it was mentioned before, uh, you know. <clears throat> Fortimas is meant for tracking status of several more than one macronutrient. But in this presentation, I will specifically uh, focus on the results of iodine status and use of iodine salt, because that is more close to my, <clears throat> my studies. And then at the second, because they get, I think, in my opinion, very interesting results. So the first round of data collection was um, conducted in uh, antenatal care facilities in four sentinel sites. And we should mention that it's not, it was specific, it was not like a assessment in, in a way how we know it. It was uh, the, this antenatal care facilities where pregnant women, where children were coming, you know, on a regular basis. So they were, um, all of them were under, it was a part of normal evaluation of uh, pregnant women, uh, which uh, included a collection of um, blood samples for HP hemoglobin analysis and also a urinary analysis. But of course, uh, you know, the, the part of the urine which was collected for clinical analysis was frozen and then sent to laboratory uh, to measure the content of uh, iodine in it. It was of course not done in the sentinel site, it was done centralized. And then in 2017, a separate national representative iodine status survey was conducted. Next slide, please. So first of all, uh, this is a map, it's a little bit too dull, but you see it's a country, uh, you know, in the South Caucasus, to, to the north is Russia, to the south, Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan, to the west, Black Sea. And there are four sentinel sites, which are two of them in Belize and Batumi, they are in uh, an urban site and two of them are in rural site and they are more or less evenly spread over the territory of the country. Next, please. So the first thing was, you know, <clears throat> the results of iodine testing. So in this case, uh, uh, we were not able to make measurements of quantitative measurements of iodine. So we decided that we will use rapid test kits and, instead. So, and you see that on that, you know, all salt samples, they have uh, blue or kind of dark blue staining, meaning that all salt in that country, all salt which uh, the participants brought were all, uh, all iodized in, uh, except one on uh, the right slide, which number number nine, but we still think that even this um, salt was iodized. It was just fortified, not, not with potassium iodate, but iodate and delivered from the neighboring country, 
and that's why it was not stained by uh, by the rapid test kit. Next, please. So uh, this is the cumulative results from uh, certain NEL survey of 2016 and uh, the national survey of 2017. The reason the national survey was conducted because the government was not kind of completely sure that the results which we had from uh, um, you know sentinel site were enough um, you know to warranty you know the situation in the country or to plan some future action so basically put it honestly they didn't trust the results because there were only very few samples collected but look at that the household salt coverage in both surveys it was shown that it's extremely high it's almost 100 percent of all salt in this country is iodized and moreover 97.6 is adequate iodized um, the median iodine level in salt was uh, set almost 33 milligram per kilogram which is completely adequate good within the national standard of 25 to 55 milligram per kilogram and then look into the median urinary iodine concentration in school age children but on sentinel sites, which were only 91 school children, and school children, then there were more than uh, 1,200, it's basically the same results 293, 298. Both of them are in, uh, uh, in, a, in a normal range, close to the upper level. In pregnant women, almost the same 47 and 634, the results are basically the same. Or close enough just to make any kind of policy decision, which in this case saying that everything is going well in this country. And next slide, please. So um, another country was Turkmenistan, and uh, this is another country situated in Central Asia, bordering of Iran and Afghanistan and Caspian Sea on the West of population 4.5 million. Unlike Georgia is mostly covered by deserts. And the early survey in the 1990s showed mild iodine deficiency. They also have national legislation uh, which prohibits uh, production and importation of iodine salt. The good thing is they have their own salt production. And not only they produce all their own iodine salt, this country has also production of potassium iodine. So they basically complete the self-sufficient. And the national sur survey first, which was conducted in 2004, also showed 100% household coverage and optimum iodine nutrition. But then for a long period of time, there were no national status survey, but periodic national surveys like DHS or MIX showed still high household coverage. So again, in 2018, um, the Minister of Health with support of UNICEF decided to implement Fortimax. And again, to coverage the same thing, you know, the iodine status, uh, you know, the anemia and um, NTD. And the first was collected, round of collection was conducted in 2018 and then presented for in uh, 2019. And next slide, please. Um, the same thing is was 11 Sentinel sites. So this is a little bit kind of one slide. On the left, there are results. There are description of, uh, uh, you know, the, the sampling method on the right. This is the results of 2004 national survey and the map of the country with the name of different regions. So on this right slide, you see that it was optimal iodine nutrition and it was optimal not only countrywide, but also on all the regions. So again, it was 11 sentinel sites, two in each of, uh, of regions, Velayas, one an urban, one a rural site. In, uh, also, there were additional site in the capital uh, city, Ashgabat. So there were same model, so the uh, pregnant women were coming uh, to them, their antenatal clinic and the urine samples were collected for clinical purposes. Part of them were frozen, sent to um, uh, the central laboratory. Also, all women brought with them a sample of salt from their households. And in this case, uh, they all were also sent to the central laboratory and they were uh, measured, there was a quantitative measurement of iodine in salt. Next slide, please. So uh, what we had with, with, with uh, regards of salt, we found out that first of all, we, uh, the estimate capita salt intake, we were like a little bit conflicting data, but we found out that estimate per capita salt intake in uh, 
uh, Turkmenistan is very high, 17. And with the iodized salt needed annually, the, you know, the calculation was almost the same as uh, iodized salt produced. So basically the predicted and the real production was basically the same. The, an expected population coverage with the product, the salt which was produced was over 100%, that I mean, taking the er all the errors of these uh, calculations. Next please. And um, so again, uh, what we found out it was amazing results that in all the, the regions of the country, because there were 290, samples, all of them, all 100% of household coverage were iodized salt with a median level, which were also, well, within uh, the uh, range, uh, you know, for uh, the standard 25 to 55. So there were only very few samples which were below, uh, you know, 25 or 50 microgram, uh, uh, you know, milligram per kilogram. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, well, then we, and when at the same time we had a trouble with the um, evaluation of um, uh, iodine status of population. Well, when the results from uh, laboratory came and, you, and, they, and they see that they are quite low, you know, in all the regions, that is less than 100 microgram per liter or less than 150, which is a lower threshold for optimum median urinary iodine concentration in pregnant women we see that something is completely wrong. It cannot be like that. Mm -hmm. With uh, this level of um, uh, salt iodization and coverage, it couldn't be like that. Like for example, the same level in Georgia, it was 211. So we thought that, and we proved that it was laboratory mistake. Next slide, please. So as we said, there were no, so well, we must say that experience of Georgia and Turkmenistan showed that 40 months, proved quite reliable a track and progress in universal salt Of course, you may say that these are two countries which had an incredibly good uh, salt iodization program with 100% coverage. So it may be different in the countries which have a patchy kind of results in salt iodization. Well, the 40 mass approach is really, really substantially less expensive and logistically much simpler than conventional representative sur sur survey. I just can, we have like, an estimate that, for example, in Georgia, uh, you know, the, the Sentinel survey, the price was somewhere around $15,000 for the, covering everything, including laboratory. The subsequent um, national survey was 10 times more expensive, 10 times more expensive. Well, um, and what is important also that uh, the assessment of macronutrient status of the population groups should be embedded in the existing system of primary health care, which will tremendously simplify the procedures and reduce cost of data collection. Well, at the same time, you know, there was also the question about that, of course, but, and uh, other you know, method of data collection, the 40 mass methodology requires very reliable laboratory capacity for assessment of micronutrient status. And we saw that in one of our examples, then the country like Turkmenistan failed to do that in a proper way. And therefore we think that is one of the main obstacles to implement in 40 months worldwide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gregory, for this very comprehensive overview of how 40 months uh, has been used in these, uh, in these two countries and also to already identify some of the uh, the challenges and uh, that still needs to uh, to be uh, thought of and overcome. We now will hear from Arnold Timmer, who is um, a senior advisor at the Iodine Global Network. And Arnold's role within IGN is to support activities in South Asia and West Central Africa, as well as to help further shape the strategy of IGN. Over to you, Arnold. Yeah, hello everybody, and it's uh, very good to see uh, many uh, country colleagues um, participating in this uh, webinar. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the why. Actually, you would say, why didn't you start with that? I think um, when you listen to the different sessions, you'll realize that, but why do we need really this 40 mass methodology? And I'm just going to shed, shed some light on a long uh, established program of salt where we run 
into problems around the data tools that are available, which is basically surveys and other routine monitoring. And let me share some experiences. Next slide. So we have done um, quite a lot of uh, iodine landscape analysis. So I'll talk about that. And then some challenges about uh, the data requirements and uh, the value that we think uh, Fortimus can, can provide to monitoring in iodine programs. Next slide. So this landscape analysis or program reviews, um, we use that uh, tool to uh, look at uh, the situation of iodine programs um, identify challenges and to formulate actions. And to date, we've done it in 63 countries in, in Africa, South Asia, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And uh, mainly done, by the way, during COVID times. So a lot of the distance uh, work was done and showing the virtual tools uh, and the effectiveness of those. This year, we continue in the Middle East and also some countries in East Africa and Southeast Asia. So the results actually provide us uh, up-to-date information on the program scale and on iodine status, but also looking at the equity dimensions, because once programs come to maturity, we see that uh, the focus should be on those that are not being reached. And also challenges in different program domains. And by that, I mean, you can think of legislation, you can think of um, supply sites, you can think of uh, management and coordination, uh, the analysis also looks at regional aspects of trade, the role of regional organizations and collaboration between different countries. And uh, important, the process actually uh, helps to engage stakeholders and to re-energize focus on, on island programs, because as I said, there have been long-standing programs and there's been some fatigue in this. And the green arrows, you see the different steps that we take we do the landscape analysis, we have country workshops, um, they then define a country action plan or uh, some actions, and then hopefully, and to some extent, most of the country starts with implementing these actions. Next slide. So let me share you some, an, an example. <clears throat> um, so in the purple boxes, you see um, the challenges that are identified, and we distinguish two different uh, aspects to this. There may be issues with the design of the program, meaning are we actually doing the right thing on paper in terms of the level of fortification or how are we going to uh, work with the different industry partners to, to reach the population? And also uh, looking at uh, how to improve the program implementation itself. If you can click once, thank you. So this is a very busy uh, picture, but I want you to look at uh, the yellow boxes first. So um, you see a flow from the salt supply side on the right. Um, we distinguish basically just like with other fortified foods or with other foods that salts, you have salt that's not iodized, salt that's poorly iodized or, or iodization that's not being sustained. Those are the main three problems that we, that we identify. Um, we, of course, we want to then see it uh, translated into adequately iodized salt that's either used for animal salts for food salt or for table salt. And then if you follow the arrows up, that salt is then being consumed and then leads to an iodine status, not just for everyone, but also for different population groups in different areas of the country. Uh, in, the, in the center, you see the central coordination, the legislation, which is basically the tool that governments have um, and to enforce that to implement the fortification program, iodization program. What's very important is that we need to know where the problem is in order to come up with a solution. So <clears throat> what we then did in this uh, landscape analysis, the blue boxes are basically are identifying the different challenges that were observed. Um, for example, there's a low awareness among suppliers in low use areas of why they need to do this. There's a low compliance, the issues with the salt quality, there's non either salt leakage into the market, uh, the quality of iodization, but also in the low use areas, there's not a, a high awareness in this particular, particular example. If you can click once more. So the red boxes are encircled uh, basically to identify those uh, challenges that relate to data or monitoring. Next slide. 
So we did then some analysis of all of these different landscape analysis. And on the left, you see some of the main observations. We see that data is mainly available from national surveys. It, and it does not tell us enough about the program mechanics. How does it work? The routine monitoring systems that are put in place, but they are hardly functioning and often not very accurate. And it really leaves the program manager blind as to where the problem is, its magnitude, how to fix it, and how to track the corrective action. We often see that supply information is very sketchy, if available at all, and the equity dimension is often not reflected. We don't know who's not being reached. And on the right side, you actually see a typical household coverage survey data over time. And you see that uh, the, the trends are going upwards but in this country, the only conclusions we can draw from this is that 80% uh, is a number we have. We, we know that then 20% of the population is using non ida salt, but we can't really tell what percentage is using poorly ida salt and what percentage is using adequately ida salt. So this is a typical uh, data we get from surveys. Next slide. So what do countries actually measure? <clears throat> um, we get national averages from the surveys and they hide inequities. We saw that 90% of countries that had an adequate iodine status nationally, half of them actually had deficiencies at subnational level. And um, less than half of the countries look at the iodine status by intervention, by iodine salt coverage, what is happening with flower fortification, for example. Um, and one third of the countries only one third of the countries look at the iodine status by wealth quintile. So to really see how are the poor, the medium and the rich population groups doing in terms of iodine status. And also we see that uh, uh, processed foods or the salt used in processed food is not really being considered at all in these coverage surveys. Um, and uh, the other tool that we use in many of these surveys is a rapid test kit. It can just tell you what Gregory already showed earlier. It's either turning blue or it's not turning blue. Does it have iodine or does it not have iodine? But we can't really say how uh, accurate is the measurement, the amount of iodine in, in the salt. And the age of the data, we observe that um, <clears throat> a lot of the data is, is older than 10 years or um, five to 10 years old. And at the bottom, the, the little table there, which is quite important, and you see that um, uh, the, the, the red, the yellow, and the green boxes shows that the iodine status, for when the iodine status is actually what we call sufficient, the, we see that um, in those countries, the household coverage in 80% of the 19 and 60 together, actually 80% of those countries actually have a poor coverage of the, of the program. So you actually make a misinterpretation if you only look at the iodine status. Next slide. So um, the dependence on the national service for program uh, performance is, is really problematic, uh, as I explained. Routine monitoring is weak. The surveys used, are used basically for program monitoring, trying to figure out where the issues are, what the problems are. And also we don't really combine these two databases that we have at, at hand, the iodine status and the uh, coverage of iodine salt. If you look at those uh, global databases and maps, it shows you the, the colors, but if you, if you would put them on top of each other, you get a different picture. And the equity dimension is not really uh, included in, in many of this uh, analysis. So what happens is that, um, Decision makers see that the country is actually doing well, judging on national averages, but in fact it's not. That leads to complacency. And um, what we see, this is a long-standing program and it has not been well integrated. So um, we really face a reduced attention and slipping of performance. Next slide. So that is why we decided in, um, in the IDA Global Network to see how can we get away from this dependence on, on service for oversight and look at sentinel monitoring and surveillance to generate more timely data on coverage and IDA status using Fortimus. So making sure that program managers have the right information on the state of the program to drive the corrective action and optimize data collection design and use. 
So <clears throat> with the uh, support of uh, APA Honda, we are looking at uh, how we can use the 40 mass model to look at countries that actually have are nationally sufficient. How can we look at subnational level to identify the spots, the areas where things are not going well? And also, how can we um, basically uh, look for, with countries at countries with all the data? How can we update the current status on the, uh, on the program coverage and the iodine status? And how can we use that to inform program adjustments and to track the um, improvements that are put in place? Also, we want to look at how to track coverage of households, household salts versus salt as being used in processed foods using market data. And also um, with the 40 mass model, as I think Gregory also explained, is you can really purposefully target certain areas where you expect a problem. So you can really zoom in on those areas, identify what's going on there, and, um, and, ident and identify corrective measures. Pregnant women is really the main uh, population group from, from iodine deficiency perspective. So um, we also look at how you can use antenatal care facilities for testing of urinary iodine. And a recent uh, study and uh, surveillance was carried out in Sri Lanka and, um, and the results also look very similar with national survey data. Um, but also look, use this, the 40 mass for monitoring early warning uh, of potential threats to the iodine status and to the program due to changes in the market distribution of, of iodized salt supply. Uh, for example, the importation of premix, which is now uh, being um, at, a, at a higher risk because of the, the global situation and the developments. Next slide, the last one. So, um, uh, not last but not least, is, uh, country stakeholders, uh, are, it's important that they uh, take the lead role and that uh, IGN and others, they are in the support role. Um, and the next step that we um, are having at IGN is to, to finalize the 40 months guidance and to pilot test it in a number of countries, which we are doing, which we're preparing at the moment. And also work with other partners to exchange our experiences and see how we can um, replicate this and combine this for other fortification efforts. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Arnold, and uh, thank you for this uh, this presentation and also for sharing the experiences in using this methodology. Um, we will now move to the second Q and A session. Uh, and all the uh, speakers uh, of today will be uh, will be participating in this uh, in this session. So even if you still have questions for Quinton or for Ibrahim, please um, share them in the in the Q and A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen because they will also uh, be able to answer your questions if they uh, if they can uh, open the videos, which I think they're doing now. Um, so. Just uh, to start, there is a question from, uh, well, first of all, there are many questions about more, if, where can I find more information on this methodology? And uh, I just wanna alert you that a link has been shared uh, in the chat uh, on the Smarter Futures uh, website where you can find more information on Fortimas methodology for all of those who have, you know, who have addressed these uh, type of questions. Um, then there is a question from Linda Lester, um, and I think um, this is a good question maybe to ask um, uh, to you, Arnold, is whether it would be more cost effective to target women of childbearing potential for monitoring uh, um, the impacts of these programs. And I think, you know, you already uh, hinted to that in your presentation. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, um, I think... Um... That makes a complete sense to look at women of reproductive age um, and, uh, and pregnant women are being selected in these uh, surveillance uh, tools um, because um, often pregnant women in, to include them in surveys is much harder because there are fewer uh, women as part of the total population that are pregnant. So to find them, you need a very large sample size. And I think what Abe also explained with the purpose, uh, purpose sampling, you can actually identify pregnant women, you can search for them in the antenatal clinics. Of course, you need to keep in mind, are you actually, who is actually going to the antenatal clinic? When are they going? So that you also know who are you, who is represented in those clinics among the pregnant women population. 
but I think it makes complete sense. Uh, and also the target for many of the fortification efforts are women of reproductive age before they become pregnant to get them into good malnutrition status. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, I think so. At least it's clear uh, for me. And if uh, if uh, there are on you know additional questions on this, then please uh, uh, write them down in the in the chat. Um, there's a second question also from Linda, and I think that's a question more for Quinton about you know you were um, referring to some technical issues, and I think that's that's maybe uh, in, is illustrative of the type of uh, issues technical issues that we can expect to happen in uh, in the lab that caused these very low urinary iodine measurements. Can you expand on, uh, on, on this issue or what caused this technical issue? And you're muted, can you unmute yourself? Sorry. Uh, actually, um, my area of expertise is basically on flower and flower analysis. Um, I have not done much on the, on, on the uh, quantitative measurement of iodine and iodized salt. Um, it's uh, relatively easy, I think, using a, using a chemical method to, of titration to measure that. It's, it's the old fashioned way and usually it may be an easy way to set up systems in existing food control labs um, to be able to, uh, to measure the, uh, the iodine content quantitatively using the classical methods. Um, it's in, it, certainly on the flower side, uh, atomic absorption, um, and there is also a chemical, ashing chemical method to measure iron in, um, uh, using chemistry as opposed to atomic absorption. Um, so there are the old fashioned methods that, that are tried and true over the years, but uh, um, uh, it's, it is a bit of a challenge. Um, also, the other thing is the training of, of technicians in many countries. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the other challenges that we run into with, with, with uh, measurement of adding uh, micronutrients to flour is, uh, is the, the, uh, the, the technology um, that has become uh, more, more and more expensive to be able to, to, to measure micronutrients in flour, particularly of the vitamins. Vitamins are a real challenge. Yeah, and, and that actually also relates to the question that was addressed in the first Q&A yeah. session, right, of yeah. the importance of developing national capacity to do these yeah. sort of assessments yeah. and also maybe of, of developing further these type of tools such that they can become available at lower costs. I would, I would like to add that uh, I, having traveled through uh, a number of countries around the world, um, that uh, donors have this tendency to say, oh, well, we'll give you these um, complicated methodologies and this, this expensive equipment, um, and it ends up in a lab. And I, sadly, I've been in a number of national laboratories where uh, equipment like spectrophotometers, atomic absorption um, are sitting under dust covers. Mm -hmm. because either they don't have the capacity to run them themselves or there's a problem and there was no funding provided to maintain the equipment. Right. And that is a real challenge in, in a number of countries. Yes. There, there is also a comment uh, actually in the chat box. Mm -hmm. I would like to encourage everyone again to answer your question, to, to address your questions in the Q&A box, but there's a comment by Philip Randall uh, on, on something that I think you presented, Arnold, uh, on one of your slides, that the sharing of information and a weak coordination of stakeholders, that, that is really, uh, yeah, are some critical issues. And that also brings me to another question on, you know, um, what are your experiences? And I'm not sure, maybe Gregory, maybe you can elaborate on that because you've been applying this methodology already in these two countries. So what are your experiences from, with stakeholders' willingness to share data? And particularly, I think the private sector's willingness to share data. Can you um, elaborate on that, Gregory? Um, yes, that's actually a very good question, you know. And um, um, in case, but uh, in, in, in two countries where we were dealing, we were basically not dealing with the 
private sector in terms of getting this information. For example, like in uh, Georgia, all information about, because it's completely 100% important country. So information came from the government, from the customs. So the customs gave us how much from each country. So it was quite easy. And in Turkmenistan, it was also quite easy. They had only one sole producer, which covers almost like 100% of the all country needs. And it's also the government owned. So again, the government provided all the results. So, but that's kind of maybe an exception. In other places, it might be quite uh, challenging, you know, to, to get this information, especially in countries where there are many small salt producers or, you know, any other producers which are made producing fortified food. Yes, thanks for uh, that. That is, um, I think, uh, a challenge we all need to, uh, to face and solve to better learn how to collaborate and trust and, and, and share data with each other. Um, there is also a question from Louise Abayomi. I hope you, I spell your name, uh, you know, I pronounce your name correct, Louise, about whether there have been any assessments on the impact of um, iodized salt or other fortified com commodities you know, using this methodology in school feeding programs um, or, for instance, in uh, refugee camps. Um, so in addition to the, um, the data that was shared on uh, the general um, um, population of, uh, of uh, women of reproductive age. Can, I'm, I'm not sure, Arnold or Gregory, do you have any, or Ibrahim maybe? Yeah, I, I can answer that. So far, it has not been used in any of these type of settings, uh, refugee camps and so on. It has been used, you know, a little bit at the national, but you know, it could certainly be adapted to that type of setting uh, if needed, yeah. Uh, one other point I'd like to just make regarding the, the source of data, you know, uh, within the, you know, from the private sector versus government and so on, uh, uh, two, two things. First of all, you know, I went in very deep, you know, over very quick overview. The point is, you know, at each country, that's why we call it a methodology which has to be adapted in each setting. And, and, and we don't rely necessarily on one source of data. You can, you know, it's a matter of, uh, triangulating information from that different sources to, to see if things make sense. And if they don't make sense, then you investigate a bit more. Um, so, and then the other part, as I mentioned in my presentation about the role of the private sector, you know, one of the hesitations, you know, hesitancy that I found when we did the workshops for the countries, the, the work, 40 months workshop would bring in the private sector, the government sector, the public health, you know, the regulatory agencies together so we could describe the methodology. And it was interesting for me, at least from my experiences, and maybe Quinton can elaborate a bit more, at first, in the beginning of the workshop, which is basically like a four or five day type event, you know, to go everything into detail, there's hesitancy on the part of the private sector to say, oh, how much, but by the end, when they see how the data is used and how, and when we, they realize that they are actually the implementers of the intervention, that is the other key. We have to understand and acknowledge that the role, the private, the food producers, if you are, are the importers, the they're the ones who actually delivered the intervention, not the Ministry of Health. And if once they realize that they are the ones who are defending or protecting their population, then they become, and how their data would be used to, to, dis, to, to show that, they become much more willing to provide information. Uh, and, and the other key on that is that once the results are done, when we, one of the complaints I've had is that we don't not regularly acknowledge them. And we write popular, we yes. do publications, we do not put them as co-authors. Yeah. They should, and they're the implementers. They should be there somehow. Yeah, so I think, I think it all comes down to uh, making, uh, making sure that we can demonstrate what's in it for all the different stakeholders and what they will get out of, of participating in this, in this process, because basically that's what it is. Christoph, you want to add to that? No, I wanted to ask Abe, uh, because he mentioned about a four or five day initial workshop, just for people to have an idea. Uh, you know, the wealth of work that's needed to implement the methodology. Could you talk to that? There's this four days workshop and then what else? How much work does that represent? Yeah, so just briefly, the, the, the workshop, you know, let's say four to five days, that includes, you know, presentations, discussions, some actual site visits to look, you know, uh, 
uh, between in the private sector and the public sector in a number of countries to be honest you know even people from the ministry of health were absolutely they had no idea that hemoglobin data is available for example in their antenatal care facilities is sitting there or neural tube defects data is in the records they are not reported so they they see that so there's this under, you know there's that part of it so and then based on that four or five days they usually we come up with an initial idea of kind of what the structure of this uh, potential 40 months approach might be. And then obviously over a period of, you know, weeks and months, depending on how quickly and people work on it, um, you know, they, they, um, a better the system or the structure is a bit more finalized. And then we do initial round of pilot data collection to see if it all works and then adjust it accordingly and then go on into the formal data reporting, if you will. I don't know if that helped you, Christoph, but that's basically it. Yes, thank you. And and um, one final question, uh, and I think it's again for you, Ibrahim, um, or perhaps Quinton. I don't know one of you, one of the two of you, which is about this methodology of using these sentinel sites sampling, which I think is also uh, a new element in this methodology that's not often uh, being used. So one uh, question from Sergio Moreno is uh, how um, uh, which which are the param parameters to calculate how many of these sites do you need in one particular country? Or is this just going to cause us a statistical course that you can't really respond in, uh, in three minutes, uh, Ibrahim? Well, I would just say that uh, it really depends on how much money you have. And that includes surveys as well. You know, as random surveys that we do, representative surveys is how much money and resources we, we have. You have to really put things together. Like in, for example, in Georgia, as uh, Gregory presented, Basically, they suggest they thought that four different sites would be sufficient, uh, and 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 then in uh, and it worked out. And based on the, all the other information we had, I cannot go into all of those details now. It's looking at the situation, looking at the information, see how things kind of link. It's putting it all together. It's not sampling sa sample size calculations or any statistical. It's basically looking at it in at the information and seeing what would be the most feasible approach based on resources and what would give the information that's reliable. And in Turkmenistan, they decided to do, they have only what, five or six uh, re regions. So they decided to have, you know, one in an urban and a rural type sentinel site in each of the regions. They had the resources at the time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, so it all comes down to funding uh, in the end. And I think um, uh, this, but it shows, you know, the kind of interest that is in there. And I do see all the other many, uh, questions in the chat for more information. So I definitely would like to alert you again to that site uh, at uh, Smarter Futures website. Uh, and also there are questions about public, you know, are there any publications, Christophe, maybe you can briefly answer that. Are there any publications that people can turn to which describes this methodology or the experiences with this methodology in more detail? Sure, so they can turn to the Smarter Future website, obviously, and they can turn to myself, Abe, uh, the people at Too Fast, or even Quentin, obviously, who's been um, involved. Um, I think we'll be presenting a slide after um, after this ends with our contact details, so they can reach out to any, yes. any one of us. Yeah, because I realized that there are also many questions uh, in the chat that we will not be able to answer, unfortunately, due to the sake of time, including a couple of why would we want to focus on micronutrients, which, you know, of course, as the director of micronutrients forum, I'm dying to give you that answer, but we will be addressing those uh, uh, through other means and, and don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, one final question to uh, uh, Gregory, um, and this is also, I think, related to the current crisis that the, uh, that the world is facing in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, and is this affecting the import of iodized salt in Georgia? Uh. Oh, I think you accidentally clicked away. Maybe Arnold, can you answer that question? Um, um, yeah, um, we looked into that and um, at IGN, and uh, Gregory also checked with the country colleagues, and he um, they have actually started to procure salt uh, from other countries. Um, but indeed, the supply because Ukraine is one of the main uh, salt producers for the region. And so they start to uh, countries start to procure from other countries uh, like Turkey uh, and others. And Gregory is back. If you want to oh. add something, Gregory. Yeah, I agree. Yes, that's that's the case. Fortunately, there is enough salt producers in the in the area. The other the impact 
which is, I think, more, more serious, is that uh, that uh, Ukraine salt was incredibly cheap. Yeah. So uh, you know, for for the region, so the every uh, all other are, is much more expensive, like two, three times. So that may be an issue, especially for iodine salt. Okay, well, thanks uh, to all the uh, speakers and and uh, and also now the panelists uh, of this uh, session. And also uh, thank you to all the participants for all your questions. It's clear that this is a methodology that is of high interest uh, to you all, which I think is very encouraging, particularly for the organizations that have been involved so far. And I'm sure uh, that there will be follow up um, on it. So I would like to uh, welcome you to uh, watch the websites of the organizations that are involved in, uh, in, in this webinar. Um, and I think, you know, just to give you some few takeaways uh, from the webinar, uh, what we've seen is that this methodology Fortimas can offer important benefits in the context of large scale food fortification programs to give quick um, answers on progress of these programs uh, that, that are, you know, it's, it's less expensive than the traditional uh, methods. It makes use and it makes actually a smart use of different data sources. Um, and therefore it, it, I think it's, it's of such high interest uh, to programs. The Sentinel sampling methodologies, there are quite some questions about it, but it is also a, a methodology that's clearly of interest and that uh, could be employed more often, um, especially also by targeting districts, either districts where there is high coverage or districts uh, where there is high need or that have a poor socioeconomic status. However, there are also some challenges, I think, being, um, being uh, mentioned and being discussed. Um, it still, I think, leaves the big question on how can we reach the heart to reach. And I think uh, Ibrahim was also referring to that in his presentation. Um, and this is a process that um, with stakeholders that needs to be aligned. And, and I think um, it's a process that really requires um, clear collaboration, uh, sharing of data, trust of each other, but also the assessment of the quality of data that needs to be taken into account. And, um, and I think the, um, the point was raised that this will require technical support throughout the process uh, or te technical capacity building throughout the process, all the way from improving lab capacity, but also improving, I think, the ability to evaluate quality of data. Um, so I think most importantly, this demonstrates again the need um, for better capacity to assess the impacts of these type of programs on micronutrient status. And then we will, it brings us back to the importance of addressing the micronutrient uh, data gap, which remains a big obstacle in many of these, uh, these programs. And uh, the use of data that's been collected through regular health services can definitely be uh, an interesting um, way forward to help solve uh, that data gap. And in that regard, it's also maybe good to mention that the Micronutrient Forum uh, in, uh, with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has recently launched the Micronutrient Data Alliance or DINA, which is um, um, a platform set up to address this micronutrient data gap and an alliance of, of, of various members to improve the availability, the quality, the accessibility and the use of data across the entire data value chain so all the way down from quality of programs to impact to support national level decision makers to better design, implement, measure and optimize programs and policies. And this platform has just been launched and more information will be available soon through the Micronutrients Forum websites and of course the websites of all the um, partners that are, that are working on this and that are uh, or presenting here also in the, the webinar today. But, we, but the DINA platform will be working on eight areas, which includes metric specification, the refinement of data and filling of the data gaps, uh, sharing of best practices and lessons learned in the use of data to, and, and new methodologies to help guide programs, which is what we've seen here today, uh, to foster and facilitate data sharing, which was addressed also in this webinar, which is critical if we were to uh, make better use of existing data support and disseminate the results of global data analysis that are relevant to micronutrient advocacy and to promote investments in data collection and advocate for the systemic use of these type of data at national level. And finally, to focus on gender and vulnerability. So there are many important conversations that are happening about fortification at the moment. 
it's uh, it's a topic that is in in um, uh, high demand and high interest and uh, unfortunately also many countries and donor organizations committed to scale up this much needed interventions so we welcome you to join us in the conversations on social media with future fortified and of all the organizations that are presenting today's webinar um, and you can find more information on uh, next future fortified webinar series uh, at the link that Kristen is now being uh, sharing with you through the chat so with this, I would like to close the webinar and would like to thank you all again for being present here in the webinar today. And we look forward to um, welcome you at the, the next webinar again soon. Thank you very much and have a nice day. All my love side to side. All my love side to side. This is how you fall in love Let go and I'll hold you up So pull me tight and close your eyes All my love side to side There's a spider on the ceiling